What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG. Strap in your droids, prepare your Mary Sues, and get your BMX masks ready to be bad guys, because it's Star Wars Squadron's time. And this game, especially for a fan of VR and a fan of Star Wars, checks more boxes than a Russian bot filling out election forms. Nonsensical story? Check. Multiplayer mayhem that recreates the best parts of the Kessel Run? Check. Single player game? Check. VR support? Super check. Let's see if these guys brought it home or if it's just another front end for a repetitive cycle of looking cool for a couple moments, then dying, or aka Anthem. The game comes out this week for $39.99 on PC, Xbox, and PS4. Let's see how it did. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So sit on back and let's discuss my thoughts so far on Star Wars Squadrons. First, I do get it. You're not running around Hoth trading, sleeping inside of Tauntaun secrets with Bear Grylls. You're in space and many times in the atmosphere of planets battling it out with other AI and people. But that did not stop me from being impressed by two things with Star Wars Squadrons. Actually, make that three. First is the locations themselves. Basically, they are just battle maps where you're based in the back end of enemy TIE fighters with laser fire. But it looks spectacular. Cloudy Jupiter-like planets with crazy storm patterns you battle through to asteroid fields to other more eclectic fare. Squadrons looks good throughout. It's much more prequels and sequels of prequels than it is the originals, though, when it comes to their color work. And most of the locations skew a little bit on the look at this shit level of color detail, but that works for me. Spaceships are detailed pretty nicely, as are the effects of the various weaponry, both ship-based as well as giant ship-based, when you fight or face off against any of them in the single player or the multiplayer. And while the spaceships themselves look fine, there's a problem here, or a disturbance in the force, if you will. When the ships blow up, they look pretty terrible. You might think, man, that's a weird nitpicky complaint, but think about it this way. The majority of the game is either you blowing up other ships or them blowing you up. So to see a Y-wing separate into what looks like a futuristic toilet paper tube and some triangles isn't exactly awe-inspiring. Also, apparently, the Rebellion and the Empire both decided to hire the only Oompa Loompas available because the scale is completely off when you're outside of the ship. I'm not sure if there's a weight requirement or something like that, but when you jump into a cutscene and notice that you are just balls high to even the short characters, it looks odd throughout. Luckily, those moments aren't that important. It's just during the cutscenes, but it is something that you continually see throughout. Where the game does shine, though, is performance, regardless of VR or pancake versions. The game's performance is stellar. No hitches or glitches or problems. The 2080 Ti getting north of 150 FPS in most places at 4K with all the settings on Ultra. 1080s doing the same at 1440p. Listen, I get it. All systems are going to vary a little bit, but this title's performance is pretty spectacular. It's not something you're probably going to have an issue with if you have a gen or even two gens back when it comes to a video card. That's nice. Squadrons looks good throughout and performs spectacularly well, even in VR, where it's going to matter even more. Now, as a VR title in particular, it's probably one of the better representations of what gamers have wanted from VR titles that lets you jump into the cockpit of the vehicles that you've always wanted to fly, even if you realize within just a couple moments how much of a terror box the inside of a TIE fighter would be. It's like flying a ball with a hole drilled in one side to see through. Whoever decided to bedazzle the inside of this thing with parts covering half the viewport deserves to be kicked in their space balls as well. Whatever though, weird complaint aside, this is a game that knows exactly what it wants to deliver and for the most part does it very well, including what really matters, which is that performance. Stay mobile. We don't want any collisions. Freedom or destruction. The Empire chose to destroy Alderaan in order to spread fear and douse the fires of rebellion. When it comes to the presentation factors like sound, music, and voice, it's excellent. Sure, this is a game where you know right away that someone is a bad guy because they sound like they're from the friggin' BBC. But it's suitable, and there is a high quality to all the voice work. Musically, the game is also stellar, as expected, and the typical Star Wars over-the-top affairs play throughout all the battles, as well as those more eerie themes that I think sometimes people miss in Star Wars that play out during cutscenes as you flip and flop back between the Empire and the Republic. Sound itself is also excellent. 
It's got that eerie scream of TIE fighter announcing its presence as you apex predator Y-wing from some hidden vantage point, as well as that almost homey sound of an X-wing roaring up beside you as you start a battle. Huge explosions, ships collapsing into the requisite parts, and one of my favorites, which is that smattering of debris on your windshield when you fly through the atomized bits of a best friend who was blown apart in front of you by that one dude called a senior mom 674 in an online battle that all sounds really good that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story it is star wars you can't expect othello you can't even expect john wick this is a world where you can tell who the bad guys are by their accent and if they sound like they have a pinky in their mouth they're gonna ask you for a million bucks that's just the way it is it follows both sides of a battle sometimes the empire sometimes the republic as you join both squads as different recruits and go into battle to basically play what is sort of a tutorial but it's spread out between those battles you can go around you can listen to a bit of lore from some of the characters as well as change out the items on your ship that you've unlocked locked and then you jump into battle now ship loadouts are interchangeable in a number of ways shields engines right and left weapons and hulls this allows for a good deal of mixing and matching and deciding what you want to do and how you want to go about that particular thing and i know right away somebody's going to be like but the ships do they feel different that's the resounding question and i gotta say Yes, they do. While the X-Wing is somewhat of a middle ground, it's sort of a Goldilocks of ships. It's not going to piss you off. It won't let you down, but it's not really incredibly fancy. There's the Y-Wing, though, which controls about as good as your fat friend would if you taped a Thrustmaster joystick to his back and slapped his ears to indicate what direction you wanted to go. But like that same friend, he's a damned workhorse. It can soak up damage and it can unleash holy hell on enemies if you line it up just right. However, if someone gets behind you, turning this turd is like spitting over the side of a boat and expecting it to move quickly. It's just not going to happen. There are other ships as well that are more nimble or less nimble as you go. The same goes, of course, for their TIE fighter counterparts. And this is a place where squadrons dialing down and focusing on one particular thing shows a bit of that excellence. It's understanding that the loadouts needed, like switching out the hull that makes missiles lock on harder, but also increases your overall ability to soak damage. And then you can mix that with mines because the ships are going to have to stick behind you longer trying to get a lock on. So the mines are a good complement. Understanding that and putting it in what I consider a good graphical representation works here. And it's pretty much easy to understand and read and even more importantly, experiment. You can also balance the thrusters and the shields and the weapons or zero them all out when you're flying around, which lets you sort of feed a little speed to your ride if you need a quick intercept or flood the weapons of a TIE fighter with all your ship's energy at the expense of being woefully defenseless for a bit. After choosing your ship and loadout, you head out. Now, the game controls about equally with the mouse and keyboard as well as the controller. I'll say that the dead zone and acceleration with mouse and keyboard feels a little bit odd at first. I had to leap into the controls to adjust it and get it dialed in. And even then, it still feels just a bit off. It might be done on purpose so that the difference between the ships can be even more profound when it comes to control. But in the midst of battle, especially with mouse and keyboard, it doesn't feel as much slow as it does just addle minded, like it's forgetting inputs for a bit and then all of a sudden turns left and just hopes no one notices it wasn't paying attention for a second. Now, when in the single player, you can do various difficulties from story to very hard. A lot of the missions are pretty much the same, though, so expect that. You're basically going out, outfitting a ship, and destroying people. Even when you have to do things like scanning, it's all done from within the ship. All of this is that front-end presentation to keep you within that battle vessel. When it comes to multiplayer, you have... AI battles alone or in co-op, you have dogfights, and after five levels, you unlock the major ship battles, which I think is a big mistake. I'm going to explain that in a second. Regardless of which you choose, you end up in the various side hangar bays, you equip weapons, and then wait for a countdown to join your teammates or get the game going. Dogfighting is pretty much what you expect. 5v5 enemies on both sides just going at it. Die and you see a kill cam, and then you can jump back in after a bit. Teamwork definitely is useful here, as you can't exactly go prone and snipe someone, though some of the missile systems are particularly long range. So grouping up, indicating you should attack or defend what targets is vital, and you can use the systems in the game for that. Right now, a good deal of randoms are in the game, figuring out what to do, but you can already sort of feel moments of teamwork coming in, or maybe there was just one guy trying to steal my kills, I'm not sure, but using an ion missile to disable an enemy and watching them flounder and then having a friend whip in and blow it up with some hull damaging lasers felt really good. It's also where the game can feel a bit clumsy. Now, let me explain. When you die, you see a quick cam, then you're back in. I started to notice a very distinct pattern in a lot of the quick cams. So I talked to some other people who were playing it and they noticed the same thing. 
a lot of people are not flying their ships almost at all. Sure, sometimes they're moving like one mile per hour, but a huge number of kill cams were people treating their ships like turrets, many times lodged up against a rock with their ass of their ship against it and waiting for people to fly by. This is a combination of insanely powerful homing missiles being in the game, your ship's overall just shit structural capacity for damage, regardless really if you have a hull that you choose that's supposed to up it, and the maps themselves. I'm sure some of this is going to change, but due to the way things are playing out right now and the auto-targeting, you can do some serious amounts of damage without a lot of the repercussions unless people all group together to whittle you down. Now, I decided to try that way of playing and went from 6 kills, 4 deaths in a game to 11 kills, 0 deaths in the game instantly. I was pretty much able to repeat that. Not everyone is doing it, and strategies will be created to go against it, but I think that perhaps a bit of thought needs to go into that, especially as the maps aren't incredibly big to begin with, and some of the maps have locations that if you fly too far out, it says return to map, it starts to do a bunch of damage to your ship, and you can blow up just by sort of trying to fly around an asteroid. This stops completely, though, once you unlock fleet battles at level 5 because it requires movement to do so. But it can give this odd feeling to that initial time with squadrons where you're like, this is sort of unenjoyable or it's just sort of namsy pamsy where you're running around, you're shooting people and it doesn't really feel that great. It's sort of, in fact, a little bit brainless. And then when you get into the actual fleet battles, that's when things start to come together and it feels so much better. A lot of people are just going to say, hey, those are basically tutorials, and I get that, but they are still there, and I think that they could be cleaned up a bit. Squadron sets out to mix multiplayer and single player, TIE Fighter versus X-Wing, and I think it actually hits in a lot of places. The story and the narrative are not as strong as those older games. The single player game is mostly a tutorial, though it does offer some cool moments as you continue on. When you return home, you get your XP as well as gear points to buy items for your ship and upgrade them. Be aware, no item is technically bad. They just offer different variables on how you'll play, so nothing is overly overpowered. When it comes to customization, you can paint your ship, you can get some items for the inside, but this time it is not that diverse. You can also pick various alien skins for your pilot, your helmets, your suit, and your gloves, and so forth. At this time, there is no store tab icon for any indication of a store that is in the game or going to be in the game. Also, shout out to Motive for a massive number of accessibility options that range from normal subtitles to text-to-speech for anything on the screen. There are a lot of options here that is very helpful for people who want to jump into the game. When it comes to bugs, I actually did suffer a couple. I especially did when it came to jumping back into the game after a death, where many times the audio would just be completely changed. I would jump into the game, and suddenly it was just music, and there was no game audio at all. And then other times, all game audio, no music, and at other times, just weapon sounds, but nothing else. It was odd, and it did happen a good number of times, both in the original single-player parts and it's happening in the multiplayer. And that brings us to Fun Factor, though, and discussing it. So far, this is a bit of a one-trick pony, but they said that that's what it was going to be, and it is at a reduced price for that. What you get is a game with some single player that's somewhat enjoyable. You can certainly up that difficulty. You can go in against the AI if that's what you want to do, as well as go in with a friend co-op against the AI. Or you can jump in to the dogfights or the major fleet battles. I would personally say that I would like to see some more modes quite quickly in this game. There's a couple reasons why. First, dogfights are fairly small so far. I would like to see those maps get much larger and more people involved. It's a little weird when every dogfight is just a couple of the TIE Fighters and X-Wings. And you're like, that's not necessarily, it doesn't really feel as bombastic as I would like. Of course, this is a balancing issue, but they have other balance problems that I would like to see them look at, especially as I continue to play this. So far though, it is enjoyable. Whether it's enjoyable enough for you to go out and spend your hard-earned cash on it currently, that's up to you. There is supposedly no game store coming for microtransactions of any kind, so what you see is what you get in here, and admittedly, every one of the actual spaceships feels completely different from each other, and it is fun to jump in there and do some teamwork. And as well, you can do ranking and you can go up in those. So we'll just see what they have to offer. So far, it is quite enjoyable. I just don't necessarily know how long I'm going to play it. Anyway, that's it for me. That's my thoughts so far. I'd like to know what you guys think when you start playing it either later tonight or tomorrow. 
Put a comment in the comments section. I would love for you guys to say whether you like it or not. You can continue watching here. We've got a bunch of reviews coming your way. We've got the podcast on Friday, iTunes and Spotify. You can listen to the podcast at any time. It's ACG on Spotify or ACG on iTunes. And of course, you can become a patron. Patron helps dramatically, especially now as everything's demonetized. Or you can head over to Teespring ACG and maybe buy some merch. Anyway, that's it for me. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.